Welcome to Popcorn Planet. I am Andy Signor, and we're going to play a few of the most important clips from Alec Baldwin's exclusive interview with George Stephanopoulos on ABC News. Unscripted. It premiered just an hour ago. I compiled a lot of notes, and I want to go through it with you. We're going to do a full legal breakdown tomorrow on our live show, so join us around 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But the two most telling moments, I mean, there were several telling bombshell moments in this interview, but I want to play for you sort of the, what I felt were the two most important as to why he didn't check the weapon was said to me, I mean, I, I got countless people online saying, you, you idiot, you never point a gun at someone. Well, unless you're told it's empty and it's the director of photography who's instructing you on, on the angle for a shot we're going to do. And she and I had this thing in common where we both thought it was empty and it wasn't. This is the biggest sort of sign of Alex's defense and what he talks about several times throughout the special is the fact that the real issue is who put the live round in that weapon. He doesn't take any responsibility for checking the weapon. In fact, we're going to play another clip where he talks about how he's never done that in his entire career. But George Stephanopoulos does push back here. And that's not her responsibility. That's not my responsibility. Whose responsibility is remains to be seen. But I do well, there are some who say you're never supposed to point a gun at anyone on a set, no matter what. Unless the person is the cinematographer who's directing me where to point the gun for her camera angle. What do you think? Do you agree with him on that? Because a lot of people, George Clooney, etc., they all came forward and were like, no, that's not what happened. In fact, George Stephanopoulos, to his credit, pushed back and said, well, no. It, why don't you do that? Alec Baldwin goes in and explains further, well, that in his 40 years of his career, that's not what he was learned. So George pushes back and asks him again, well, why is that? What I was taught by someone years ago was, as I said, if I, if I took a gun and I popped a clip out of a gun or I manipulated the chamber of a gun, they would take the gun away from me and redo it. The prop person said, don't do that, when I was young. And they'd say, one thing you need to understand is we don't want the actor to be the last line of defense against a catastrophic breach of safety with the gun. My job, they told me, man or woman, my job is to make sure the gun is safe and then I hand you the gun and I declare the gun safe. The crew's not relying on you to say that it's safe. They're relying on me to say that it's safe. When that... But they didn't even have that person on set. The person who was on set was doing do two, two jobs. And the first AD, he reveals in the interview, which I'm going to talk about as well and give you a lot more of what was said, there's literally a quote at some points where Hannah, the armorer, says to her, to him, uh, to always hand it to me. And Alec goes, well, 99% of the time I handed it to her or I handed it to Halls, the first AD. He acknowledges that that was what the, the protocol was on this set, which, guys, I've been on enough sets and I know enough people who are on sets. That is not normal protocol. That's just not normal protocol. I know a lot of ADs, professional ADs in this business, they don't handle the weapons. Even on low-budget films, that's not what you did. But he says, Hannah would hand me the weapon 99% of the time, but if she was away on the set, it would be handed to me by Halls. Which is very weird. It's very weird that he says that. And there was another point where he's like, I assume everyone who's shooting low-budget films is stretched, including me. No one said anything to me. I didn't know there were problems. He talks more about that. But I, I want to continue this direction where he's sort of not taking any responsibility and saying, well, that's not what I was taught. The person who was charged with that job handed me the weapon. I trusted them, and, and I never had a problem. And ever. this was from the beginning of your career? From, from day one. There's one person that's supposed to make sure that what is in the gun is right and that it's, what's wrong is not in the gun. One person has that responsibility to maintain the gun. And what is the actor's responsibility? I, I guess that's a, that's a tough question because the actor's responsibility going this day forward is very different than it was the day before that. Yeah. Why? Why is it different, Alec? Why if so many other people, George Clooney and everyone else who George Stephanopoulos called out, why were they wise to this and you weren't until today? Oh, because you didn't follow the protocols that are very common on movie sets. So Alec leans into this several times throughout the interview. And now, now I can't, first of all, I can't imagine I'd ever do a movie that had a gun in it again. And um, I can't. When There's you say one, one of several moments where Alec try, he, he constantly says, I'm not the victim here. He says it over and over again. I'm not the victim here. There's two victims here. Yet throughout the interview, he does definitely try to victimize what he's going through, and which is, I understand, he's absolutely going through things. I don't doubt that for a second. I do believe he feels 
compassion for this. He feels remorse. Uh, absolutely. But so many times throughout this interview, he's definitely playing for uh, woe is me. Hey, what is the actor's responsibility? The actor's responsibility is to do what the prop armorer tells him to do. And we did not have a problem. I mean, I understand there was an accidental discharge at one point on the set. We did not have a problem, except for that time. And there were multiple. I, I've been told there's multiple times, two or three that that happened. He's saying there was one. So he's still, I guess, ignorant, or I guess we don't have the news. It's, it's so hard. To, the investigation clearly knows. But I find that so telling when he sort of is like, we didn't have any incidents except for those few dis discharges. None of those incidents except for those few discharges. Of a blank round, but we did not have a problem for me until that day. Everything gets... No problem for him until that day. Okay, well, that, I mean, that is sort of key, too, because the question isn't why is, is he responsible? What did he know as a producer? It's a lot of stuff they go through and talk about in this interview, uh, and he, he does answer that question as well. And I, I can't play the whole interview here, guys. I, I, I Bear with me, because I've played enough, and, and for news purposes, I hope they know this is commentary. This is important news. These are really important pieces that I wanted to give you and react to uh, and offer this news commentary, because this is the first time we're really hearing from him. And, and, and the biggest question that I had as this was started was, with well, the first First one, George Stephanopoulos asked him, which was, why speak now? Why are you doing this? And Alec goes on and says, well, there's criminal and civil litigation that could take a while. There were some of these authoritative statements that were out there and they were wrong. I wanted to sit down because I can't wait until February or March or whenever this investigation is going to start giving us answers. Uh, and he, he's sort of just fed up. He's like, there's too much misinformation and it's time for me to tell the story, the same story I told them. He then reiterates so many times I would go to any lengths to undo what happened. So then they asked, well, how could this have happened? And he, and he goes, there's two things. When I talk about this, I don't sound like a victim because there are victims. He, again, he does this. Uh, Helena and I both thought the gun was empty. Uh, then they go on and talk. He, he sort of, the, the second thing was, was really just, again, who, the, the first thing was that there's two victims. The second thing was, why was there a live round? He reiterates, reiterates, reiterates that point countless times throughout the special. They go on to talk about Rust, how he, he was a story with him and Joel, his friend, the director, who also got shot. He seems to be okay. Uh, but then they asked really quickly, like, well, what was your role as a producer? He says, I was purely a creative producer, casting and script. And so George Stephanopoulos asks him again, so you're not looking at the line items in the budget. No, 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 Alex says. No, 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 no. Um, at six minutes into the interview, it's his first breakdown, which we saw in sort of the, the, the promos out there where he breaks down over Helena. Um, and it does seem like he's, I, I do believe there are real emotions here. I don't believe he's acting or faking as some people are saying. Um, they, then they go into more about the, the safety briefings that he had with Hannah Gutierrez Reed, the, prop, the armorer. Um, and uh, they, on the, apparently the 12th, they had a safety meeting. Uh, and uh, they, you know, George asked him, well, do you think she was up for the job? And he says, I assume so, because she was there and she was hired and she was up for the job. Is how he sort of reacts. He's, he's putting all the blame on the crew is what he does. Stephanopoulos pushes again, so she didn't raise any red flags. Alec Baldwin says, no. And so then they talk about sort of the training session, and she explains that she gave her tips about firing. When you're done, lower the weapon, et cetera, et cetera. And then it reiterates again, only give it back to me or Halls. So this is the first I'm hearing that Gutierrez was working so closely with the AD, I guess, as the armorer assistant, that the fact that the AD was handling the weapon is strange and not that's not normal on sets um and that's he was responsible if she wasn't there but that's my biggest problem this whole set what if she's not there she if they're doing firearms she should always be there she should be the one who hands it she should be the one who takes it that way there isn't this weird question as to who put it in she's the one who has it she's the one who's kept it locked up she's the one who's checking it before the shoot everything alex saying as his excuse he's sort of acknowledging well we didn't follow those guidelines because there was this other person who was sometimes taking it as well specifically on the day that it happened and then later in the interview he makes a point of he doesn't want to he doesn't think either of them really are responsible either he doesn't want to make them suffer there's a point later in the interview where he's like i didn't want anyone to suffer especially hannah and halls how, how he felt bad because he believes like it wasn't their fault. But I just get frustrated watching the interview because I'm like, well, then whose fault is it? Whose fault is it besides the people who loaded the weapon? Um, there's so much more to go through this. And I'm trying to just give you a quick rundown rather than just play you an hour interview. You can go watch it. I think it'll be streaming on Hulu as well. And again, we're going to be playing some more clips and going through more of the most important parts tomorrow around 12 o'clock Eastern Standard Time live tomorrow. I'll put it at the end of this video to join us. Um, but... It comes to the question of why hand it to Halls and not Hannah. 
And then he says, Hannah would hand me the gun 99% of the time, but if she was away from the set, I'd hand it to Halls. I assume every... And then he goes into... Uh, the only time I heard about issues regarding, you know, beyond sort of he, he, allu he sort of quietly sort of mentioned, like, yeah, there was a misfire. The only time he addresses if there were other issues on set where he says, well, the last time her issues was when Looper quit, which was the guy we did an interview with who's, who, who quit. He was part of the camera assistant team. He's, Looper said, came and said, thanks for speaking to the Aitzi, Aitzi uh, union issue that Alex spoke up about. Uh, and uh, apparently Looper, the guy, his only thing he's talked to Alec about was we need more hotel rooms. He never brought up anything of safety, according to Alec here. Uh, and then Alec does this really weird moment. In fact, I, I do want to I do want to play this portion because it's just so weird how once again he's like playing it like, well, I was gonna, I was gonna take care of the crew. Um, yes. He also this is the Lupin. day before that happened. We wrapped, and he came up to me and he said, "Thank you for the position you've taken on behalf of IATSE and the union on social media." I said, "My pleasure." This photo posted by Helena. There was no mention of safety issues. He didn't say anything about the accidental he discharges on set? He didn't say anything about anything. He goes, my men need better hotel rooms. I said, well, we're leaving, we're wrapping. Will you be here tomorrow? He said, yes. Because what I was about to do, which I've done on any number of films and TV projects, was to give more of the, my salary back to the production to pay for X. And I was about to say to him, let me know what it would be to be and be you guys in a house that's closer to the, how we can address your problem. I will be happy to contribute to, to that. The Why didn't he say that the night of? Next day, they were gone. So he, it's like a weird way he tells that story to me where it's like, I want to believe him. But I don't know about you, but it just feels like a, ah, oh, well, I was asking, are you going to be here tomorrow? And he didn't show up. But I was going to say to him the next day that we were going to pay for your hotels and solve the big problem. It's a really weird way he tells the story where I do feel like there's some manipulation in that part. The other part, I, I would be remiss to not post because I did find it quite strange. It, quite, quite strange. He gets emotional on the second time for this interview at this point where he's talking about his career. And I understand this. He may never work again. And he was finally, he, he's feeling a lot of feeling, but he gets emotional when he talks about work, making movies and working with Anthony Hopkins. Any chance he could and then, they, then he, does, he does this part about how he was tears working with Anthony Hopkins, and then this Amazing. comes in. When they cast me in It's Complicated with Meryl, I thought, I'm going to get to go make a movie with her. <laughs> it, you know, <clears throat> sorry. You know, people, they have their dreams. No matter how old you are, you have your dreams of people you want to work with. And this movie made me love making movies again. I really thought we were onto something. Literally, probably the most breakdown he does in the movie in this whole interview was that moment of Meryl Streep. And I just, it, I, I, I watched it in just disbelief of like, wait, what? I understand he's going through a lot, but again, <laughs> It just fell out of place. There were a lot of moments in this where it just fell out of place, coupled with this fact that he really doesn't want to bear any responsibility. Uh, he goes on and talks more about how everybody there was having a positive experience. People have no idea what it's like to experience motion pictures and set. I do. And it, it does create this idea of community. But for a lot of people, especially lower end, it's a tough job, Alec, especially on independent films. You're in charge. You're doing the creative stuff. But everyone else is doing all the heavy lifting for you. And for you to speak for everybody saying everybody was having a positive experience was another weird thing he sort of did because they asked like were costs being cut at the expense of safety and security and Alec goes no I did not observe any safety or security issues while I was there uh, he then gets emotional again a little bit more about how great the crew was uh, he was sitting on the pew and that's when this that the, pivots to this weird moment where he cries over Meryl Streep and how he's so glad he was in the movies and I guess he feels like he's never going to make movies but then later in the interview he gloats and a weird not gloats but he makes a point to point out that he has another movie that's coming out that he's going to shoot in december and he asked if they wanted him to be gone and you know they're cool they're going to keep him on it and he's like well i don't know if i want to be on it was a very weird like self uh, uh, like <laughs> he didn't need to say it there, there's a lot of sort of like justification that he was putting out in this interview that did rub me a little bit the wrong way because he keeps talking about there's no victim etc cetera, etc cetera, but then makes it a lot about himself which i understand we want to hear his thoughts but the timing of this was odd um he's then he gets into the, the he didn't pull the trigger that's the biggest thing that everyone saw in the, in the trailer and we're going to talk in detail about that tomorrow and, and i want to get your thoughts on how that's even possible um 
He talks about how you never take one and just go click, click, click on the ground. It can damage the firing pin. Um, uh, he says when he heard it was a cold gun, he that's the sort of cue to relax. It has no charge, just a dummy round. Uh, when he held it, he his whole account of what happened was that he pulled back the, the hammer, and then when he let go, that's when it fired. He didn't ever have his finger on the trigger. Halls, the AD, has backed up this account and, and confirmed he didn't see Alex's hand on the trigger. Um, when he let go, the gun was supposed to be empty. I was told it was empty. Nothing with a charge at all. She goes down. I thought to myself, did she just faint? The notion that there was a live round was impossible. Uh, I sat there for 45, 60 minutes never thinking it could have been a live round. I thought maybe it was wadding, which is like cloth that uh, it can feel like a poke sometimes if it pushes out because of extra the powders down the, pushes down the powder um, I kept thinking, did she have a heart attack? The idea of there being a live round was not even the realm of possibility. That's when they were forced out of the building. Um, the cops showed up about 15, 20 minutes in. She was taken out for some time. They finally airlifted her out. Uh, it wasn't until she got he got to the police station hours later. It was like uh, aliens. He's like, it was like seeing aliens accepting this idea of there being a live round in that gun. 45 caliber slug is what they showed him a picture of on a phone saying that's what came out of Joel's shoulder. He was just shocked. There was this live agony that someone put a live round in that weapon. Um, then they asked about that photo that's all over the place. And that was the moment. Apparently at the end of the interview, that's when they said uh, she didn't make it and that's was him calling his wife which i can't even imagine and it does that that photo was very raw and emotional and that really was apparently the moment he was calling his family to say that she didn't make it um so uh, a lot more was happening the other thing that was very telling to me he talks about how you know he, he does he does speak about how this little boy doesn't have a mother i have six kids uh, you know, until my wife comes in and then I'm, I'm, I'm a great dad until my wife comes in, I'm invisible. They go to their mom cause they love their mom. And I can't even wrestle with the fact that this boy now doesn't have a mom. He does just seem to really understand that and speaks about that. Well, I do believe he feels for this family. He talks about how he spoke to the husband. Um, he then goes into what the clips we paid played, uh, they call it the George Clooney one. And he sort of reacts like, yo, a lot of people saying things that have no idea what they're talking about and weren't there. Um, when, when asking about the responsibility, I played you that clip as well, but he really gets into why was there a live we weapon? Uh, when they asked, were you worried about being charged? He says, it's, I've been told that it's highly unlikely I'd be charged criminally. There's still potential of civil lawsuits, two of which have already been filed. Uh, do you believe the set was sabotaged? He says, no. Uh, I don't know how that could have been possible. When they, we made, when they made these claims of sabotage, I thought, well, that's a big swing. It's how he sort of, he, he, he uh, worded that. Um, he says that he, he doesn't think that's possible because what would be the purpose to attack who, to harm who, our production, me, what's the motive? It's more likely just an accident. But then he's very keen on like, well, where did that weapon come from? There's, there's a lot of talk now of a prop house that was, uh, they served, they showed up to try and figure out why. There's thoughts that maybe that's where, they just didn't know. But again, that would fall along Hannah Guterres, who should have checked every round that she got from any prop house to verify that those were dummy rounds. So again, he's trying to play it like it's an accident, but then he's also clearly saying, well, who put it in there? Was it an accident or did someone put a live round in? He doesn't want to accept sabotage as an option uh, and admits that that doesn't seem like it's possible. He then says, I don't want to see anyone suffer unnecessarily. I feel terrible about what's happened to Halls, the first AD, and Hannah. Where did that bullet come from? Someone brought live rounds, plural, onto the set. I don't want to see Hans, Hannah or Hall, Hall suffer. Makes a whole point of that. And then Stepanopoulos asks, like, do you feel like people are coming at you for your political views? He, of course, takes that bait and says, yes, Trump says I'm a wacko and killed her deliberately I, just when things can't even get more surreal. And for the record, super lame of all the Trumps trying to make this a thing. I understand they don't like Alec Baldwin, but my God, a woman died. It's so classless and just only speaks to their character. And Alec makes a point of pointing that out when asked. Um, also found it odd. This was the other thing I wanted to get to that's, sell, set, uh, that's definitely telling, and I agree with him. He's like, I found it odd that two civil lawsuits jumped in and lunged in to file before the husband, Matthew, was able to actually file something on behalf of his son. He explains later on that like, when you make these insurance claims against it, there's a pool of money that's you know, finite, fine, that you, you know, it's limited. And uh, he thought they were filing that before Matthew could get in and get his claim for on behalf of his son, who he thinks absolutely deserves a right to, you know, do. He thought was very unsettling. And I got to agree with him. It does, it's a weird look for those two crew members, one of which Alex says, 
put his hands on, and, and I, I guess this was Serge, one of the electricians, who said it was not Alex's fault, and now has changed his tune. He, a, a quote from him later in the interview admits, yes, I didn't feel that way, but now I do. Um, he then talks about how these images are unsettling and keep him awake, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and uh, he's exhausted. I got to be there for my family. That's all I have. I don't give an F about my career. And then when asked, is it over your career? George asks, he goes, well, who knows? I have a film shooting in December. That's the, the sort of it just felt a little weird that he's revealing that they don't need to. He, he told us that to be like, see, guys, I'm still working. Leave me alone. Uh, but I don't even know if I if I asked if they wanted me. I don't know if I'm going to do it. George asked, did you tell your kids? He said for the two older ones, they had to tell what happened. And then he tells this story about walking through New York and people react to him differently now. And then he catches himself. It's a, it's a tell. When you catch yourself playing victim, you say, I don't want to sound like a victim, <laughs> which it's like, you're sounding like a victim. That's why you're saying it. Um, that's when they ask, is this the worst thing that's ever happened to you? And he immediately goes, yes. Uh, that was in the, the clip that you guys saw, the promo. And then when asked finally near the end, do you feel guilt? He pretty quickly says, no. Someone is responsible, but it's not me. If I thought it was me, I'd probably kill myself. What do we do? What do we come out of this? Learning. This is one in a billion that someone put a real bullet in that gun. This doesn't happen. It's out of the realm of responsibility. Who brought those onto the set is really where it, where it was. The film then ends with a sort of tribute and his thoughts on Helena Hutchins, the, the, the real victim here. Um, and uh, she was a great talent. And he talks about it, just one of the loveliest people and how admired she was. And it's just truly tragic that we lost her. Uh, so that was the, the basic summary of what we caught in this interview. I'm really curious to get Christopher Melcher's idea Ideas and his thoughts later we're going to watch some more clips and get some of the points that he, he caught but again a very very interesting choice for alec to do this interview overall i it's a mixed bag for me i applaud him for trying to be honest I, I, and seemingly being honest and putting it out there at the same time it's a lot of him saving himself which i, I can i can i can sort of see that too however the timing feels a little odd and some of his answers and sort of victimizing himself didn't play as well for me, and I, I do think he'll regret. Does he say things that make him seem you know, guilty? I want to get Christopher Melcher's idea tomorrow if we can get him on, uh, do analysis, because uh, I don't think this is going to help him. Uh, the public is either going to accept or not, but I think a lot of people have pretty much made up their mind. And, I do, and from some of the feedback I've gotten from you guys in the chat room on our Telegram, it does seem like not everyone's buying Alex's story here. They do think he's not really taking enough of the blame, which he can't do because then he's going to get sued criminally, civilly, etc. Uh, he doesn't believe he's responsible. And I hear his point of view, but really, what do you guys think? I want to hear your thoughts down in the comments down below. If you haven't already subscribed, can you please hit that bell for alerts? Smash that like button and leave your comments down below on what you think about this. Please keep it civil. Let's have civil discourse down below if we can. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to tune in tomorrow. Today, I guess, depending on what time you're watching, 12 Eastern. We're always live on weekdays. Thanks for watching Popcorn Planet.